We've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, last week we kind of set the stage for it, and so I left the four chairs up here just to remind us of uh, the four different kinds of people we discussed last week. We started with the guy in the first chair. Chair number one was the natural man. He's the man without the spirit. He's without the spirit. He, he's got emptiness inside. In, in Ecclesiastes, it says, God has set eternity in our hearts, and, and the only thing that can fill that eternity is God himself, but he doesn't have that. And so he lives on a horizontal plane. Everything in this world is just horizontal to him. The next thing we saw was all the way over on the other end is the spiritual man. It says, but the spiritual man makes judgments about all things, yet he himself is not judged. Why? Because he has the mind of the Lord. Radical difference between this guy and this guy, that gal, this gal, and that this one has God the Holy Spirit in them. And so where this person lives totally on a horizontal level, this person lives on a vertical level, plus a horizontal, but has connection with God. Now, in order to get from this chair to that chair, you've got to have a conversion experience. You've got to accept Jesus as your Savior. You've got to be born again, born anew, born of the Spirit, is what Jesus said. So you go from there to this infantile chair. No one is intended to stay in this chair. This chair is temporary to get you to that chair. God wants you to grow. But like a baby that desires a sincere milk of a mother, so the Bible says, that a new believer desires the sincere milk of the Word of God. There should be a natural inclination, a desire to have the Word of God. And and when you get into the Word, you begin to grow. And the more you grow, you move on from the the simple things of the faith to the meat. Okay, you get a hearty meal from God's Word. Now, if you're in this chair and you're just a baby Christian, new convert, but you don't grow, you just kind of sit here, you really don't. The text says that when you should be growing, you kind of slide back towards what you used to be and you find yourself in the the carnal man's chair over here. And uh, the carnal man looks like, acts like, talks like, smells like, thinks like the guy in this chair. When the truth is he should be doing all of that like the guy in this chair. And and so this this guy over here has got a struggle. He's kind of got like one foot back still in the world and one trying to live with God. He's a double-minded man, James says. He's unstable in all of his ways. And so I want to do a contrast between these chairs today as we look at the, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, how many of you got some fruit this morning? I, I, I to, all right, you got some fruit? That was clever. Fruit of the Spirit, have some fruit beforehand, all right? Uh, there'll be some there probably after, but uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Now notice it's one fruit, singular, a lot of people say the fruits. No, it's one fruit. It's got nine aspects. It's like nine grapes on one cluster of the fruit, okay, of grapes. There's nine different aspects. And the first one I want to look at is love. Now, love in our language, I mean, we got one word for love. Uh, I can say, I love chocolate ice cream. I love football. I love my wife. Well, hopefully, I love my wife in a different way than I like chocolate ice cream, right? (laughs) All right? Yeah, okay, so we use this one word. Now, now in the Greek language, there are five, at least five, different words in the semantic domain for love, and there they are. Now, I don't expect you to know Greek, all right? But there's the five Greek words, and you can just see looking at them. They don't even look the same. They're not spelled the same, And, and they all have something in common that they all reflect the concept of love in that one semantic domain. Uh, I checked in Hebrew. In the Hebrew Bible, there's over 10 different nuances, 10, all right? I just want to focus on these in in the the Greek New Testament, all right? Uh, The first four are found in the New Testament. The last one's found in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. But these five words tell us a lot about love. And they tell us a lot about how people respond to love. The natural man, okay, he sits in this chair and he says, I love you or I love whatever. He's doing it solely on a horizontal plane. That's it. Everything is horizontal to him. It's it's for here and now, this life. The person over in this chair realizes, "Ah, God is love. 
And so everything here, love, is connected vertically. And that vertical, we're going to see, spills out horizontally. And so love is so important. The way that these five words are used are so different between chair number one, chair number four, and, and this person, this chair, he's learning this and he's moving this way and the person over in this chair is falling back into the old patterns of life, old habits of life, not having what they can have because they're stuck in a rut. So I, I want to look at the spiritual man. The spiritual man's concept of love. Epithumia is the first Greek word that I have there, and it means desirable love. I like you. Uh, almost 20 years now, more like 19, but almost 20 years ago, uh, I was living with my parents. My mom had died, and I was staying with my dad. And I came home one day and said, Dad, I met this girl. He thought, okay, so what? You meet a lot of girls. <laughs> Single guy, you should be meeting girls. I said, no, Dad, I really like this girl. Catch my drift? I later married her, but, uh, you know, I said, I really like this girl. All right, I like her. There's something about that where there's a the, there's concept of love where I like in a special way. Th that's this desirable love. Now, now, the second one is a reciprocal love. It's phileo. We get the word Philadelphia from it. Phileo adolfas, Philadelphia, brotherly love. And it's reciprocal. It goes back and forth. I love you, you love me. I like you, you like me. I invite you over to my home, you invite me over to your home, and we build this relationship. It's back and forth. It's reciprocal. And, and, and here's, here's where it says, well, I like you too. All right? And so there was a point at which, you know, I kind of told Diane I liked her, and she said, well, I like you too. <laughs> and we were dating, and I said, well, you know, I'm not dating anybody else. And she said, well, I'm not dating anyone else either. Why? Why? Because we... We liked each other, and we liked that experience. See what's going on here? I, I, I like you. I like you. It's a reciprocal love. The, the third one is storge love. Storge means belonging love. I, I belong. It's kind of a family term. And, and when two people, you know, after they've been dating for a while, the, the one person says, I like you. The other one says, I like you. And I, I'm not seeing anybody else. I'm not seeing anybody else. But we belong together. You see? Uh, this is the word that... Uh, uh, is used for like a, a family. I belong to a family, and, and people want to belong somewhere. They want to belong somewhere. God made us social beings so that we want to belong somewhere. And, and when, did you ever notice that, um, that the, uh, we have like the mafia, and they call themselves a family? <laughs> And when you join the mafia, you join the family, you belong somewhere. They want to belong, okay? So the story is a belonging love. And it says, uh, well, I love us. I love us. I like us being together. I love it. The next word is agape. And agape is a sacrificial love. This one says, I, I love you no matter what. The Bible puts it this way. God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were still sinners... Didn't matter. Didn't matter what you've done. I love you no matter what. It's sacrificial. I love you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrates his love towards us and that he died for us so that he would save us from our sins. This is a sacrificial love. I also call it a committed love, a committed love, that I, I make a commitment. I'm committed, all right? It's the word primarily used for God's love. When everywhere you find it in the Bible, God love, you'll find, God, you'll find this term, that God loved us. It's the supreme, sacrificial, committed love. The next one is eros love. It doesn't occur in the New Testament. It does in the Old Testament. In the story of Esther, Esther is a Hebrew girl. She's drop-dead gorgeous. They're having a beauty pageant, and King Xerxes is having all the beautiful women come before him. And uh, when he saw her, he had eros. Whew. She must have been one hot babe. He had immediate, instant passion for her. Eros, passion. I love you passionately. I love you passionately. All right? The spiritual man, you know, he, he's got a, a focus on these, like I'm telling you, but on the other side, there's the natural man. The guy sitting in this chair, okay, he's the natural man. He distorts every single one of these. And I'm going to show you how this works, Okay? Instead of saying, I like you, this person says, I lust you. 
I lust you. Because horizontally, it's nothing about God. It's all about me and what I can get out of this world. And so I lust you. I lust for you. Instead of a phileo reciprocal back and forth kind of love, this is a codependent love where it says, I need you. I am incomplete without you. I am the nurse or the doctor and you're the patient. Because you're sick with alcoholism and I'm the doctor, I can fix you. I have a relationship. And if, if you ever get cured, then I'm out of my job. And so there's a codependency on a person. I'm the fixer. I become the enabler. And it's a codependent thing that's going on here. Instead of reciprocal, there's a dependency on one and the other. It's kind of distorted. It's, it's, it's all horizontal. It's, it gets distorted. The next one is a trapped love. The guy, uh, it's kind of like what I talked about, you belonging, you want to be in the family. It's like being in the mafia. Uh, then you decide, well, shoo, I don't like this family. But you're trapped, and you can't get out. And, and so the storge belonging love becomes a trapped. I, I'm, I'm in a relationship that I just can't get out of. I hate this relationship. I'm stuck with you, and I hate it. You see what's going on here? All right. There, there's another abuse or misuse here, and, and that is the exploited love. Instead of I sacrificially love you and I'm totally committed to you over in this chair, over in this chair it is, I'll walk all over you. I know you're committed because you're committed. I know I can do anything I want. And so I walk all over you. I manipulate you. I use. In fact, that leads us to the next one. Instead of being a romantic love, I mean, like in, in the book of Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, a romance be, between Solomon and the Shulamite woman, and, and it's just very passionate and romantic. This becomes sensual. It becomes a user and an abuser of a love relationship. Now, I kind of laid those out. Natural man, spiritual man. And uh, so over here, the, the, the natural man, Lustful love over here. Desirable love. I really like you. Over here, I'm codependent. I got to have you. I need you. Over here, I just love hanging out with you. This is great. You love hanging out with me, you know? Best friends for life. O over here, we, we, we've got, I'm trapped. I want to get out of this relationship. Over here, uh, it's belonging. Over here, I'm exploited. I'm being abused and misused by you. Or I'm uh, abusing and misusing you. And over here, is a sacrificial love. Two people, no matter what, looking out for the other's best interest, you know, whatever, whatever it costs me. Over here, it's sensual love. While over here, it's romantic love. My question at the top of the screen is, so what do you want? Now, everybody says, well, I want this kind of love. And then I say, well, you're searching for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> See what I'm saying? People want that, but they live over here. How do you expect to have that if all you do is live over here? If you want to have all the love that God intended you to have, you got to get out of this chair. You got to get out of this chair. You got to get in this one and start moving this way. So what do you want is the question. Now, along with these go certain characteristics the guy in this chair has love vices. This person gets caught up into pornography. This person has virtue. They get caught up in purity. Over here, instead of pornography, they get caught up in fornication, sex out of, outside of marriage. Uh, unmarried people having one night stands, all that goes with that. But over here, claiming virginity, even though they're thought a fool. What? This is the 21st century, right? But knowing that virginity is what God calls for, anything outside of the, the bond of marriage is sinful in God's sight. And so it, it stays away from that. The guy in this chair, see, he says, well, how close can I get without falling into it? Right? The babe that's growing in Christ says, how can I get over it? I want to climb into this chair. I, I, I'm going to stay away from that as much as I can. They stay away from adultery. That's a being a married person and uh, you know, having a, an affair with someone else. 
Instead, they're committed to their heterosexual relationship with their own wife. There's no homosexuality. There's fidelity. Over, over here, there's incest because it's all horizontal. It's all about me. What can I get? But over here, sacrificial love. I would die to protect a person's honor and value. You see what's going on? It's so... Our, our, Here they're enjoying the pleasure of sin for a short season. It's short-lived. They gratify their, their, their desires and then they say, is that all there is? And then they got to move on to something more terrible, more worse. But over here, it says all these things I just listed, purity, virginity, fidelity, uh, a heterosexual or marriage relationship, being a protector of a person's uh, honor and va values, there's no law against these. But there are laws against all the stuff going on over here. Did you ever notice that? Lawbreaker, lawkeeper, day and night. See, love fulfills the law. The Bible tells us that. You say, well, I hear what you're saying, but I want to go a step further. Does not even nature itself teach you? In 1 Corinthians 15, it says that. Not a whole different subject, but I want to take that line. Does not even nature itself teach you? Desmond Morris is not a Christian. Uh, he's a zoologist, a sociologist, an anthropologist. He's a scholar. And he was doing study on animals that bonded for life. That is, two of a mate, if the other mate died, would never bond with anyone else. That's it, mate bond for life. And someone said, well, you know, you've done your research on that. How about man? Because man's just an animal. Well, and they're thinking he is, not mine. We're image bearers of God. We're direct creations of God. We're a little lower than the angels, all the things the Bible says. But he did the study, and he found that there's 12 steps that people go through to bond a relationship for life. And I want to go through those quickly. Now, Donald Joy is a Christian. He studied their research, uh, Desmond Morris's research, and said, wow, this... This follows the Bible pattern. And so uh, in his book, he builds on that book. And then there's other authors who have too, and I want to to this morning. I want to go through these 12 steps really kind of quickly. Uh, there, if you were to read the book, you'd find that there's a whole lot more to all of these. But I, I'm going to kind of summarize them, make them a little more succinct. And, and the first three are this, eye to body, eye to eye, and voice to voice. Eye to body. I was on a panel discussion at the Kensington Church for their singles ministry and there were 120 singles out there, and one lady walked in late, ta-da, Diane. And I got there early, because I was on the panel, I wanted to meet the people who was gonna be on this discussion, because the topic was singles and uh, sexual purity. And they could ask the panel anything they wanted. So I wanted to meet the people who are gonna be asking me questions, you know, get a feel for them. And I didn't see her, but I saw her then. She immediately caught my eye. I was on that panel discussion, and uh, pretty soon I noticed that, well, she'll say that, well, everybody was looking to the front at me, but I know she was looking at me. <laughs> because I was looking at her. I was looking at her, she was looking at me, and there's this eye to eye, okay, this eye to eye is that moment in a relationship where you're looking at the other person, they're looking at you, and you go, oh, I'm caught, I got caught. You, you know that feeling? All right, where I'm interested, huh, they caught me in my interest, okay? It's that aha moment, okay? And, and that's what it is. First one, you just notice the person. Wow, where in the world has that person been? The second one is, whoa, they're looking at me like I'm looking at them. And the third one is, how do I go say hello to this person for the very first time? Voice to voice. How do I, how, how, how do, I do that? And voice to voice, you know, have this contact. Now, these three are so simple, so quick, but they're universally across all cultures. You got to do this in order to build a relationship that bonds for life. It seems so simple, like who, who would have even included this in the process? But where it's really telltale sign how important they are is when a relationship breaks up. These are the same three signs. People stop talking voice to voice with one another. I'm not talking to them because I am upset. They don't look eye to eye, whereas before, man, you'd gaze in each other's eyes. You, oh, you had that euphoria because you were caught, you know, and, and now I, I won't, I'll talk to you. If I have to talk, I'll answer you while I'm in the refrigerator looking for something to eat, and, and I'll talk to you, but I'm, I'm not going to look at you in the eye. Or it gets to the point, I don't even want to see you. So 
I'm going to go to the bar after work instead of coming home because I'm hoping I don't have to see you. You see what happens here? These may be simple, but they're foundational uh, of building a relationship that bonds for life. Now, in step number four, five, and six, well, the first three are called no touch. Okay, there's no touch, just dynamic going on. The next three are first touch, where you actually hold hands. There's something about nine square inches of palm to palm that makes a person break out in a sweat or get to goose pimples and all of that. I can remember with Diane, we were driving, we were going somewhere, and I just reached over. We were in the car, and I reached over, and I grabbed her hand. And Diane will tell you, she said, Ooh, I thought this was just going to be a friend, you know, another guy friend. But the stakes were heightened the moment I took her hand, but she didn't let go. <laughs> I like that, you see, you see? But you see what's going on? There's a dynamic there that's going on, hand to hand. Now, now the next one is called arm to shoulder. You put your arm around the person's shoulder. Watch when you go through the mall. You'll find that some people are walking with their arm around the shoulder and they're staring into the blue and they're talking to each other. They don't look at each other. They're looking out. The other one is, after they've gone, you know, they've developed a relationship, the one will put their arm around the other's waist and pull them in a little tighter. Now, the psychology and all that stuff behind this is simply this. All three of these, four, five, and six, are saying we belong together. It's a social statement to the whole world. I'm with this person, they're with me. If you're in a singles group and two of you are doing that, everybody else in the whole group knows, taken, off limits, don't try anything there. Belong to somebody else. Go find some other fish in the sea, all right? And so, but they're a social state in that way. And each one gets progressively more intimate. Now, there's a phenomenon that goes on while, while this stage is taking place. They're walking and they're not looking at each other and they're talking. And normally when they're walking with their arm like that, their head is tilted down. And it's like there's a hidden vault there or something and they're talking and they're pulling things out of that. And they talk about everything in life. What's your favorite color? Oh, blue. Well, hey, I like green. And, and they start sharing from the most mundane things to very personal things. How many children would you like to have? Well, I, I'd like to have three. Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to have six. Whoa. What were they doing? They're saying, we belong together, but we are testing each other's worldviews to see, am I socially compatible with the other person? And so when they, when they go through this process, it gets to a point where they say, the person says, well, I don't think they're socially compatible for me. I'm going to break this relationship off. Guess what? They can be best friends for life forever. But what? something happens right here at step six going over to seven. Because you see, three, four, five, all of this so far has been really a head exercise, a little bit of emotion in there, nothing really highly invested because you're still exploring with your mind, is this person compatible with my worldview, where I'm coming from, where I'm going to? But when you cross the line to number seven, number seven, everything, everything changes. Number seven is mouth to mouth. Now, I'm not talking about just a little simple kiss. I'm talking about, you know, what we used to call it, making out. <laughs> Intimate kissing. I liked uh, what um, um, Desmond Morris said. It's a, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like this. That this kissing is uh, two people exchanging benign bacteria so that they can stomach each other. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so next time you think about that deep kiss, <laughs> you say, I'm just checking out, can I stomach this person or not? But actually, something's going on there. You're exchanging benign bacteria, and you're getting each other's systems, bodily systems, ready for a sexual relationship. That's what's going on, all right? And they'll tell you that. Mouth to mouth is where you start, you start kissing, hand to head. This is an interesting one. You don't let your head go into somebody's hands very often. Your dentist, your barber, your spouse, your grandkids maybe, <laughs> not many people. Well, I thought, well, I was dating before Diane, and uh, I, I was going to test this theory. So I was at, I took a gal to the Pistons game. I'm sure she liked that. And uh, so we're at the Pistons game, and I decided, first date, I just reach over and touch her face. I'm testing this. So I reach over, and you know what she did? <laughs> Why? 
We don't let just anybody touch our heads. It's vulnerable. But at this point, the person will, you know, twirl the hair. They'll stroke the hair. They'll, they'll touch the face. And, and it's a sign of profound trust. I trust you. That's where the sacrificial commitment kind of thing comes in. I'm committing my most vulnerable part, my head, to you. And then the next one is hand to body. And that's not like mauling the person. This is, no, no, no. This has to do with a profound respect for the other person and the way God configured them. You see that little mole on the cheek. You say, oh, you got the cutest little mole. Come on. Come on. Anybody? Are, are moles cute? Come on. <laughs> All right, you know. Oh, he's got a dimple just on one side. Or, oh, you should see my guy, man. He's got the hairiest chest. Oh, my God. Well, some people say, he's like a big teddy bear. And other person say, oh, how gross. You know, you see what, what they do at this point, it's that the hand to body is where you recognize the way God configured that person. You say, God made you special just the way you are. And I love the way he made you. You don't need to change a thing. Isn't that amazing? This is a step that he noticed cross-cultural. I watched a, a program on this one time on, um, I believe it was the Discovery Channel. And uh, this is cross-culture. It doesn't matter if you're Chinese, American, European. This is the way it works. The way it works. Now, the next three, okay, the next three uh, actually have, have to do with marriage. And if you've gone through these steps, through these steps, the next obvious steps is you get married. It's called mouth to breast. It's called hand to genital and genital to genital. Well, the final sexual penetration, and then procreation, and having kids, and the cycle starts all over again. <laughs> all right, you see what I'm saying? Now, this is very interesting because I just described to you the five kinds of love that I noticed in the Greek New Testament, and the first one is desirable love. Uh, I like you, where the person sees eye to eye. Whoa, I like that person. I want to meet that person. Next one's reciprocal, where, where you, you look at them, they look at you, and then you find that I'm talking to them, they're talking to me. And then the next one is, hey, we belong together. You go to the next one, it's, I call it committed love here. It's that sacrificial love where I am willing to sacrifice and commit myself to you. It's at this point, engagement promises are made. I'm committing myself to you to get married and then the last phase is romantic love is this wonderful this is beautiful this is right biblical stuff now here's what's going on love has a glue in the middle of it i call that steps four through nine there's the glue and the hardening agent four through five is the glue and then the hardening agent is seven through nine, and that's the step that bonds the relationship together. A spiritual person will take their time and work their way all the way through that according to God's word, not compromising. And in the end, what do they wind up with? They wind up with a good marriage that lasts 50, 60 years because they built it on a foundation of the word of God. The problem is in our culture, the natural man, this is Hollywood, this is Hollywood. They go, one, two, three, I see you, you see me, we talk for a moment, and our conversation is, whose place, yours or mine? They jump, the next scene, you see it on TV, every single night, you watch any TV program, you watch this, the next thing, they're in the sack together. They have skipped in the middle, the whole middle section, they skipped it. So there's no glue, nothing to bond them, nothing to keep them together. They have a relationship built on nothing. But the guy in this chair is horizontal view. It's all about me. All I can get, all I can take, it's all about me. Problem with the carnal man, he's got a foot over in this world and he's trying to do relationship the wrong way and he wants that result. But he's got his foot in over here. See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? Is it any wonder that divorce is rampant among both the natural and the carnal man, and it's very minimal among the spiritual man. God's way always works. God's way. God's way. You see, the Holy Spirit indwells a holy people. 1 Thessalonians 4 8. God gives you his Holy Spirit. That guy's got the Holy Spirit. I got the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit. You yourselves, you're, you know that your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's repeated. It's repeated. God really wants you to get this. The Spirit of God is in you. It's an important point. You see, 
He wants you to live a holy life to fully experience God's love, which is a fruit of the Spirit. First Timothy, we'll run through this quickly. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, I'm, I'm just a messenger here, folks. I'm telling you what God wants you to know. Watch what he says. It is God's will. People say, I want to know what God's will is. Oh, you want to know God's will? Start reading. God's will is in this book. You want to know what God wants for your life? He says, listen, God's will, that you should be sanctified. The word sanctified is the same as the word he, uh, holy. And so you can jump down. I got them both circled there. Holy, you can put them both places. It is God's will that you should be holy. Or at the end, in this way, that, that is sanctified and honorable. You can switch those terms. They're the same word. God wants you to have a holy marriage. Nowhere does it say in the Bible he wants you to have a happy marriage. Isn't that funny? Now next week we're going to talk about happiness. And we're going to say, God gives you happiness on steroids when you're in this chair. (laughs) Okay? But people think, oh oh, man, I'm over here, but I want what's over there. You can't be here and there at the same time. And he's saying here, God, it's God's will that you would be holy. The word holy means to be set apart from the common ordinary and be very special. You're dedicated to a specific special purpose. And God says, you, the people of God, have been set apart by God for a very specific purpose to honor God. Not just to fulfill all your own fantasies. He says that you should avoid sexual immorality. That hasn't changed, folks. The stuff they're putting on TV, Hollywood, HBO, all the rest, all this chair stuff, it never leads you to that chair. It never does. He says that each of you should learn to control his own body. Uh, That's the ninth fruit of the Spirit, self-control. I learn to control my own body in a way that is holy, holy. God wants us to be a holy special different from, from this chair. When we're in that chair, we should be saying, man, I got to climb out of this. I got to get back. God doesn't want me identifying this way. He wants me identifying that way to be holy and honorable. Now, he says, not in passionate lust like the heathen. The heathen is the person who doesn't know God. He's the natural man. They don't know God. Don't, you don't want to make, you don't want to love like this person. You don't want that in your life, but so don't give it out. You, you want to get out of that chair. You want to get over to the other chair. And that in this manner, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. When I was in singles ministries, I'd say, you've got to be a perfect gentleman on a date. I don't care what, how provocative she might dress. You cannot take advantage because God says No one should wrong a brother or take advantage of the brother or sister. Listen, it's not right. Then he adds this. The Lord will punish men for such all such sins. I'm not saying that. God's saying that. God's saying that. As we've already told you and warned you, here's the warning. For God did not call us to be impure. He didn't call us to be in this chair. He called us to live a holy life over in this chair. Does it make sense? Therefore, whoever rejects this instruction does not reject man. You're not rejecting me if you, oh, pastor, you're so outdated, you're so old-fashioned, you need to go back to the Ice Age. You're not rejecting me. Look at what he says. But you reject God who gives you his Holy Spirit. It's not rejection of man, it's rejection of God. Then he turns and he says, now about brotherly love. Oh, he turns right back to love. This is the word Philadelphia in Greek. Phileo and Adolphos, Philadelphia. Brotherly love. We do not need to, to write. For you yourselves have been taught by God to, now he turns it from brotherly love, agape, to sacrifice with a commitment love to God, to each other, to each other. I want to wrap it all up. 
The fruit of the Spirit encompasses all of these, desirable love, reciprocal love, belonging love, sacrificial love, romantic love, but primarily sacrificial love in this passage. And God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. If you know Jesus Christ, the love is in there. You just got to get it out. So, as it also says, and I say, live by the Spirit. So I'm supposed to be living by the Spirit. I'm supposed to be over here. I'm supposed to be living by the Spirit. And not gratifying the desires of the sinful nature over in this chair. The question is, how do I do that? Well, the Bible tells us, be filled with the Spirit. Talked about that last week. Being filled means, I don't get more of them. I got all that I'm ever going to get. But I allow Him to fill every aspect and part of my life. My social life, my work life, my financial life, every part of my life. I allow God, the Holy Spirit, to be in control. I give Him the keys to every room in my life. How do I do that? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, it says in Colossians. Right after talking about being filled with the Spirit, he says, let the word of God dwell richly. I'm telling you right now, you can't be a spiritual person and not be a person of this book. It's impossible. Impossible. How do I do that? You just do it. <laughs> you just do, you get your Bible out, you read it, you say, Holy Spirit, speak to me, change my life, work in me. When he points something out to you, you just do it. And when you do it, then the Holy Spirit will produce his fruit of that incredible kind of love. And as we will see next week, an incredible joy that will supersede all happiness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word and that we don't have to be like the world at all, trapped, abused, misused. Uh, Lord, all the things that are characteristic of an erroneous love gone wrong, but we can have all the love you intended us to have if we would just move ourselves away from a natural man and a carnal man to become a spiritual man. Help us do that, I pray, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. To have his way in us, and that's the most important thing. Somebody said, well, you know, I blew it. I didn't quite go through 12 steps like that. I didn't get to that destination like that. It's interesting, Donald Joy also has another book. It's called Rebonding in the Image of God. Because even if you've blown it, God is in the business of repairing what's messed up. That's what the Bible's all about. From Genesis 3 on, God fixes what we mess up. But you just got to move to the right chair. You've got to turn your life, your heart over to Jesus Christ. If you need help doing that on your way out, say, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I'll know exactly what you mean. And we'll, we'll get away from everybody and Whatever the area needs. Maybe you need to, you, you, maybe you're, you're in chair number one. You say, I've got to get out of that chair. Or maybe you're in chair number two. You say, I, I need to get out of that chair. It doesn't matter where you're at in your life. You say, Pastor, I need to talk to you. We'll break away from everybody else. We'll pray and make sure that uh, you get reconnected with God the way you need to. Father in heaven, bless us as we have some refreshments now. In a few moments, uh, Lord, while we're having the cake, we'll extend right hand of fellowship to Amari and bring her into our church family bless that and Lord if there's someone here who's struggling <clears throat> they got a relationship issue with you and it's causing relationships with problems with other people make this the day they get it right move out of the chair they're in get into the spiritual man chair help us do that Lord we pray bless the refreshments to us now in Christ's name Amen God bless you